On this episode of Five Things, have you ever thought about using a Hackintosh? Wondering how they perform? Or maybe, just maybe, you wanna build one. Fear not my tech friends, for on this episode, we've got you covered. Hello and welcome to another episode of Five Things, a series dedicated to answering the five burning tech questions that you have about technologies and workflows in the media creation space, plus tech stuff I dig and how it's used. I'm still your host, Michael Thomas. So, uh, I understand you like Macs. So do I. So much so that today we're gonna choose the parts you need, we're gonna build one, and then see how it performs against current Apple computers. Let's dive in. Why build one? If you spend any amount of time following Apple, you've realized that they are a consumer technology juggernaut. Phones, tablets, watches, headphones. This has led some to speculate that Apple isn't actively paying attention to the professional market. Oh, cause Apple doesn't care about us! <laughs> <clears throat> that is, Apple isn't making computers for those of us who need a lot of horsepower for creative applications, plus expandability to make the system more powerful than what the factory model ships with, or what Apple deems us as worthy of. We also need to look at the cost. The Apple logo carries a price premium, and without much exception, Apple computers are more expensive than their Windows or Linux counterparts. And while I concede that a ready-to-roll machine should cost more than the sum of its parts, Apple tends to inflate the cost more than most. Another reason to build a Hackintosh is, well, because it's there. Because you can. Well, physically anyway. I'm not a lawyer and debating the legalities of building a Hackintosh is not my idea of an afternoon well spent. However, the tech challenge in and of itself is enough for some to dig in. Lastly, owning a Hackintosh means at some point you're gonna have to troubleshoot the build due to a software update that breaks things. If you don't build it yourself, you're not gonna know where the bodies are buried, and you'll be relying on someone else forever to fix it. For all of these reasons, I rolled up my sleeves, grabbed some thermal paste, and went down the road of building my very own Hackintosh. Look before you leap. When building my Hackintosh, this was my cardinal rule. See what others had done before, what hardware and software junkies had deemed as humanly possible, and follow build guides. Although I was willing to build it, I didn't want it to be a constant source of annoyance due to glitches, and then no avenue to search for answers if things went south. Part of building a Hackintosh is being prepared for things to break with software updates, and to only update after others had found the bugs. I wanted to keep the tinkering after the build to a minimum. More creaty, less fixy. The main site online for a build like this is TonyMacX86.com. The site has tons of example builds, a large community on their forums, and even better, users who have done this a lot longer than me. A great starting point is the buyer's guide, which has parts and pieces that lend themselves to the power that many Apple machines have. A custom Mac Mini, for example, is closely related to the horsepower and form factor you'd find with a Mac Mini. As I tend to ride computers out for a while, I decided to build a machine with some longevity. So this is the oldest personal computer in the world. Pretty historic junk, but the question is, what do you do with it? Longevity meant building a more powerful machine, and thus as close as possible to a Mac Pro. And wouldn't you know it, there's a section called Custom Mac Pro. The downside to a machine as powerful and expandable as a Custom Mac Pro is that it's fairly large. After I took inventory of all of the expansion cards I'd want to use, I realized I didn't need everything that a Custom Mac Pro afforded me. The large motherboard in the system, known as an ATX board, was simply overkill and was too large of a footprint for my work area. I could actually go with something a little bit smaller and still have plenty of horsepower. So I looked into the custom back MATX builds. M stands for micro, and the micro ATX board would have been similar to a full-sized ATX board, but a bit smaller. I'd also lose some expandability with a smaller micro ATX motherboard, but I could use the same processor that I would use in a full-size build. In this case, a Core i7-8700K, and still get a decent amount of RAM, 64 gigs, and have a couple of PCIe slots for a graphics card and a future 10 gig card. 
I then went through the process of combing through the forums to see if there were any guides or posts pertaining to the parts outlined in the Custom Mac Micro ATX section. And wouldn't you know it, there was an extremely in-depth post that outlined each step in detail. Next, I cross-referenced the parts listed with reviews online, and I also consulted various communities and folks to get some independent opinions. This caused me to change a few things up, like getting quieter fans, a more stylish case, and a few minor tweaks. At this point, I was fairly convinced that the parts and accompanying guides and forum posts were going to be enough to point the way, so I pulled the trigger and bought the parts. As the build was going to be massively based on the work that others had done before me, I purchased the parts via the site's referral codes. Sure, I paid a little bit more, but let's support the community, eh? I'll post the exact specs of the machine at 5thingsseries.com along with the prices as well. Now that the parts were ordered, it was time to prep the Mac OS installer. A computer won't do much for most of us unless it has an OS. In order to get the Mac OS onto a non-Apple machine, we need to prep the OS appropriately. Step one is to download Sierra or Hi Sierra from the App Store on another Apple computer. Step two requires us to download a Mac app called Unibeast. Unibeast will take the Mac OS installer and place it on a bootable USB stick, along with an app called Clover, which contains the files needed to allow the OS to install on non-Apple hardware. For step three, we need to format a USB stick for the OS to be on. Make sure it's formatted as Mac OS Extended, journaled, and make sure that the partition size is relatively small. Unibeast recommends a seven gig partition. Larger sizes, like the newer 128 gig, 256 gig, or even larger sticks just won't fly. Partition them into a smaller size. I also recommend a USB 3.0 stick. It'll make things go a little bit quicker. Launch Unibeast for step four and follow the prompts to select the USB stick, as well as various options for install, such as the Clover EFI boot type, which I'll get into in a minute, and inserting legacy graphics drivers into the install if necessary. Then, let your Unibeast create your installer on your USB stick. A note about the EFI bootloader config. When your Hackintosh boots, it looks for an EFI partition. The EFI partition contains basic system drivers and options. If your EFI folder is borked, well, so will your build. This is where Unibeast, Clover, and your hardware all need to be in sync. As you'll see later on in the video, my EFI folder during the USB stick build was no bueno and caused a bunch of issues. Now that we have our Mac OS installer prepped, let's get to the hardware build. Day one of the build, and I'm here at Keycode Media. It's Saturday, and no one's here. So they let me build the machine with the caveat that I tell everyone that they do not condone the building of a Hackintosh and that Apple is a valued partner to Keycode Media. All right, here's all my gear, but I'm missing one thing. All right, now that I'm caffeinated, let's get to work. First thing is to get the side and top panels off of the Corsair Air 240 case. That way I can start installing the parts and uh, pieces and start threading cables to the right place so they can attach to the internal components uh, and motherboard as easy as possible. First thing you're probably wondering is why I don't have a blazer on, to which I would respond, it's the weekend, brah. Second of all, we've got the power supply unpacked, we've got the case unpacked. First thing I'm gonna do is install the power supply in the case. If I do that first, that means I can maneuver the cables around everything else I put uh, inside there. So I traditionally do that first. So let's get that installed. For a power supply, I went with the uh, Corsair RM750. Uh, this power supply is a little bit overkill for the build uh, as it stands today. However, uh, I intend to install a 10 gig card in the future, plus some existing spinning hard drives. Uh, I also anticipate needing to install more fans as the system grows. The 750 has plenty of jacks uh, from which I can run power to all of these devices. So now that the power supply is installed, I'm going to flip the case over to the second compartment and we're going to retrofit the fans with more quiet ones. Uh, and then we'll get into the ooey gooey good stuff of the motherboard and the GPU and CPU. 
So as I poured over the parts list, uh, I made a few changes. Namely, I chose different fans. Uh, the Noctua fans are known for being exceptionally quiet, and they're only a few dollars more than traditional fans. So even at first glance, you can see that these fans are, are completely different. The Corsair fan uh, right here is hard plastic. Uh, you'll see that it's a little bit flimsy, uh, and to hold it to the case, there's actually screw holes that go through here, through the fan, to the case, uh, which can cause vibration after a while. The Noctua fans are, are a lot sturdier. You can see there's rubber on the sides, and also instead of screws that go through, there's actually a rubber grommet that we would put through. Uh, and then, of course, we'll cut down on vibration. So I got the 120 millimeter fan installed. Uh, the rubber grommets are kind of a pain. Make sure you have needle nose pliers to actually pull them through the fan. Now their motherboard is what I spent the most time researching. Uh, I went with an Asus Z370 as it could take the same processor uh, as a larger motherboard and it also gives some expandability for the future. So right now I'm being limited by two things. First, I don't seem to have screws for the motherboard. It doesn't appear the motherboard came with screws. It should have come with the case, but I can't seem to find the screws that came with the case. I'm also out of coffee. <sighs> no, no, too big, damn it. No, 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 too big. So after a half hour of searching, I found enough screws throughout the shop to get the motherboard in. They're all kind of a mismatch of orphan screws, but it's all in there. Okay, here's the processor, the Intel Core i7-8700K. It's the latest model, and the reviews online have been great. All right, now it's time to put the processor in. Now that the processor is in, we want to put the heat sink on so we can cool the processor down. I went with another Noctua part, the NHD9L. Uh, now I had the option to go liquid cooled, but anyone that remembers the old Mac G5s, the leaks that happened, would never want to repeat that. So the heat sink has a fan inside of the heat sink as opposed to over it. So I messed up. Uh, apparently the heat sink needs to have a backing plate which comes through these holes here and unfortunately these holes can't be accessed to the other side of this case so i have to pull up the motherboard put this underneath and then put the motherboard back in so i'll be back in a bit okay the motherboard is out and now i can place the bracket through the rear of the unit since the motherboard is already out i'll just finish installing everything here so let's put in our brackets We need some thermal paste between the heat sink and the processor, and then we can uh, screw the heat sink over the processor, and now I can put the fan into the heat sink. Okay, so now we have RAM. Uh, I wanted to go with 128 gig, but going with a smaller motherboard means I had to rethink this. So I went with 64 gig, which I'll install in pairs. I'm kind of excited to try this as my boot drive. Uh, it's an M2 NVMe. It's essentially an SSD, but instead of plugging it into a traditional SATA port, it has a faster port on the motherboard for read-write speeds in the thousands of megabytes a second. Uh, they do, however, get mounted kind of funky here, uh, vertical to the motherboard. As for the graphics card, I went with a GeForce GTX 1070, as I plan on using it for CUDA acceleration uh, in Adobe apps. All right, all the parts are in, graphics card is in, processor, RAM, heatsink, fan. But let's fire it up and see if it works. Fan started. GPU fans are going. Rear fan is going. Flux capacitor, fluxing. No smoke, no flames. Lights on the motherboard. And look at that. Looks like I'm getting something on the screen. Now here we have the uh, uh, Asus motherboard BIOS, which we're going to configure according to the install guide uh, recommendations on the website. So I've made all my changes. I've got my bootable Mac USB stick. Uh, we'll put that in the back of the machine here. 
Now we'll save the uh, BIOS changes and we'll restart. Now we have the moment of truth. The Mac USB stick is in, it's booting. Well, that's promising. And there we go. With the machine built and no smoke coming out, it was now time to dig into the Mac OS. So here we are with build day two. Back at Key Code for day two. I'm reminded by a text that Key Code Media does still not condone this build. So there you go. It's day two and I'm back at it. Yesterday we got the machine to boot and today we're gonna to troubleshoot Mac OS issues. Let's dive in. Oh shit. that's not right. Is that the wrong driver? Shit. I told the Clover installer when I built the USB stick to install NVIDIA drivers. Maybe I chose the wrong ones? Well, I suppose I can download the ones from the website. Let's give that a shot. Shit. Looks like the Ethernet drivers weren't installed either. Are the wrong drivers installed? Maybe I should have made a hack and watch or a hack and Is it too late to have a donut? Is it too early for whiskey? What if <laughs> really spelled dog? What the hell? Did I choose the wrong career? I wonder if this is an EFI partition problem. Did Han shoot first? Is Goofy a dog or isn't he? I mean, he walks a dog and wears pants. Alexa, no Jefferson Starship while building a Hackintosh. If the graphics drivers aren't loading, what else isn't loading? Microwaves are too slow. Well, I'll probably have to edit the config.plist file. Did I turn off the stove? Yeah, I should have told that driver that no, he was the jerk. Is CUDA installed? What's the airspeed velocity of an unladen swap? I wonder if there's a version mismatch between Clover and Unibee. I should have ordered the steak. Built the city. Built the city on rock and roll. So what I think may be happening is the wrong drivers are being installed from the EFI partition, uh, which just may be hosed. Uh, so I need to change them out with known good drivers. What I'm gonna do is utilize the script I downloaded, uh, an EFI mounter three. Enter in my password. I'm gonna mount the EFI. All right, what I've got here is I've mounted the EFI partitions of both my USB boot stick um, as well as the install of Mac OS X uh, on my SSD. I'm going to copy the EFI folder uh, from one volume to another and see if the old EFI uh, will help this boot any quicker. So let's open the stick and let's open the EFI. There we go. And now I'm just going to copy this EFI and I'm gonna say replace. Okay, now I'm gonna shut down, pull out the USB stick and see if that helps. That's a lot better. Let's log in. One, two, three, four, five. Same as my luggage. Graphics seems to be right. It's using the web drivers I'm willing to bet. Let's take a look. And yes, it is it's using the NVIDIA web driver. I think that may have solved it. Um, I guess that means I the uh, what was causing the issue was rewriting the EFI folder um, via cl the newer Clover. The build is done. Mac OS seems to be performing nicely as do some of the more creative apps. The machine is all put together and uh, all the cables are cable managed. Now it's time to take it back home and put it back into the studio. The question everyone asks is, how was their performance? First, we have black and white analytics, raw horsepower. A common tool to measure this is Geekbench. You download the Geekbench app, let it run, and whammo, you've got performance metrics. I decided to compare my build against a top of the line late 2017 iMac Pro retailing for $13,199, as well as against a late 2013 Mac Pro canister with a retail cost of about $7,000. My build came in at just over $2,500. I've outlined the specs of each machine here. You can see that my build beats the Mac Pro hands down, but is beat pretty well by the multi-core performance of an iMac Pro, 
albeit at a price tag that's five times as expensive. As each of these computers were built with different parts, a straight horsepower comparison isn't enough. So, I also benchmarked all three systems with Adobe, Apple, and Avid software. First, I did timeline render tests with Adobe Premiere Pro 2018. I also used Adobe Media Encoder and exported to an H.264. The results were pretty much in line with the Geekbench results. The iMac Pro was the fastest performer, followed by the Hackintosh, and then the aging Mac Pro. Remember, the shorter the time, the better. Now on to Final Cut 10, version 10.4.2, where I expected my system to fall down due to the graphics card being an NVIDIA card as opposed to the AMD cards often found inside Apple computers. I did a timeline render benchmark, plus a compressor encode time trial. For renders, all three systems were very, very fast. In fact, Final Cut 10 rendered faster than any of the other NLEs. My Hackintosh did indeed end up rendering the slowest. However, all systems rendered within a few seconds of one another. That being said, my build exported the fastest, barely beating out the iMac Pro. Lastly, Avid Media Composer, where I tested with the 2018.5 Ultimate version. The iMac Pro came in first again, with the Mac Pro actually slightly beating my Hackintosh. However, all three systems were within seconds of one another. Export times are largely irrelevant out of Media Composer, because each system exported at exactly the same time, given Media Composer's reliance on 32-bit QuickTime 7 for exports. So how long did it take you to build it? The initial build took nine hours. This includes research, the hardware build, the software build, and initial software troubleshooting. However, in the past month since I've built the machine, I've had to spend an additional three hours troubleshooting thermal issues and buying two additional fans and installing them. Do I have any regrets? A few. The motherboard I chose didn't have Thunderbolt on board. Not that I have any Thunderbolt devices, but it would have been nice to have an option for the future. I also haven't seen much performance gains between OpenCL and CUDA playback inside Adobe apps. I purposely went with a GeForce GTX 1070 SC as I expected performance gains with CUDA enabled, as other apps, namely Final Cut 10, are optimized for AMD cards. I would have rather have gone with a Vega card, use OpenCL inside Adobe, and still maximize the performance from other AMD enhanced apps. So was it worth it? As a full-time tech nerd and part-time creative, yes. First time I've built a computer from scratch in over a decade, and I learned more about the underpinnings of the Mac OS than I otherwise would have. But does this cost savings outweigh the peace of mind of a fully supported, warrantied, and sexy looking piece of Apple gear? For someone who is a full-time creative professional, I'm gonna say no. You need a system that works, one that you can apply updates when needed and easily add hardware and software. Time is money, and the less time you can spend troubleshooting, the better. Have more Hackintosh questions other than just these five? Ask me in the comments section. Also, don't forget that I'll post all of the parts, pieces, and guides I used for my build at 5thingsseries.com. Also, please subscribe and share this tech goodness with the rest of your techie friends. The more the merrier, and I'll be your bestest tech friend. Until the next episode, learn more, do more. Thanks for watching.